Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panelists, Ruzwana Bashir, founder and CEO of Peak, John DeLieu, principal HPE Growth Capital, Eric Nakfa, co-founder and COO of Kluke, and Jack Lewis, president of Fat Tire Tours. All right, guys. Well, your segment has gotten a whole lot of attention in the past couple of years. Um, the digitization of this space, you know, everyone's gotten interested. Uh, it took about 20 years for Viator, which was one of the, you know, the first online platforms in this space to get bought. And now, less than five years later, we're here on stage with, you know, a startup that's raised, you know, 300 million. What has changed in the past three to four years for this shift um, to happen in the space? Rizwan, I'll start with you. Um, I think that um, you've really seen mobile have a huge impact on this industry. Um, the consumers on their phones, when we started peak, about 20% of bookings were coming through mobile. Now it's closer to 55%. Um, so you're seeing the consumer demanding activities in real time uh, in the next few hours on their mobile phone. And so what that's meant is that the merchants themselves are also coming online. And so I think in many ways we're in a similar spot to what the hotel industry was like 20 years ago when you saw the proliferation of OTAs and all of this inventory making its way online for the first time. And so I think the reason you're seeing a lot of investor interest and others coming in is because actually there's going to be a huge amount of value created in the next few years as more and more of these uh, activities become bookable online. Today, $150 billion market, very little of it still purchased online, um, but that's going to be changing in the next five years. Okay, great. John? Not a lot to add to that. I think the, uh, on the supply side, though, the, a lot of the players have been very traditional, uh, largely offline, and, and like in every industry, that changes, and I think this industry is just largely lagging. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think that's, uh, that's actually one of the main drivers there. And like, there are small things also on the consumer side. Like, for example, in Europe, uh, data roaming charges were super high between countries. Those have now fallen away, so people are not that shy to use their telephones when they're traveling anymore. Yeah, great point. Just, yeah. One, just one example. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't agree more with Ruzwana. I think mobile is the key. Uh, really the key uh, game changer for our industry. And just as, you know, Kluge, we are kind of a leader in the direct-to-consumer. So for reference, for example, 80% of our bookings actually happen on mobile. So without mobile, I think this, this industry wouldn't be where it is today. Um, uh, I think secondly, uh, especially in Asia, is the rise of the budget airlines that has made travel a lot more affordable. Uh, the, the likes of alternative accommodations as well has made um, travel a lot more affordable as well. So people are spending, in fact, more when they're in the destinations. So I think that's giving rise to also the growth of the tourism activities and in-destination space. Okay, Jack. Yeah, I think beyond just the distribution and the things that have allowed distribution to happen is there's a lot that's happened at the supplier level that's allowed suppliers to even come online mm -hmm. and tools that are, have been available in the past three, four, five years that weren't there previously that now allow OTAs to come in and actually have access to that inventory. It's been such a fragmented space at the supplier level um, that a lot's happened that's allowed distribution to increase and then obviously uh, a little bit more attention on the investment side. Why did it take so long for us to get here, right? It's not like travelers just now started doing tourism activities, right? It's really the stuff, that's what makes them want to go places. So why do you guys think it took so long for us to get here? Activities aren't commoditized. Um, it's not like a hotel room where it's one thing. Um, what you see in our space is that um, businesses have multiple buses or boats, they have many guides. So in order to enable you know, the shift online, you actually needed to have software that allowed those businesses to utilize it to have online booking. And I think it's only in the last few years with that accompanied by mobile. You know, These businesses are in the middle of a city. They're on a beach. They're in the middle of a forest. And so if you think about the opportunity for them to run their business using a mobile phone, that's changed things in a huge way. Um, and so certainly for us, we see uh, millions of check-ins happening through uh, iPad or iPhone apps with a guide who's in the middle of a city um, with, our, with our Peak Pro software. So I think a lot of the, the inventory coming online, uh, it's been necessary to have software that can enable that. Uh, and that's really only happened in the last, I'd say, three-ish years, um, where that software allows about 40-plus verticals to be mm -hmm. able to come online um, and do that. So I think that's been a big shift. If you don't have the inventory, you can't sell it. Mm -hmm. Now, but why were there no technology companies before that? Jack, how long have you guys been using you know, third-party technology for your companies? When did that shift happen? 
we've been using third-party technology since early 2000s. It so happened that the first technology we used was probably built for a hair salon that we just kind of manipulated to be able to sell online. Um, you know, Fair Harbor, Bokun, Peak, I wish those things were available when, when we were looking. Uh, they okay. weren't, so we went proprietary and built our own and realized there were better SaaS options out there. And um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a long journey in a very short amount of time to allow suppliers to get connected with this type of distribution. So that more specialized actual tools for this specifically started to come through. OK, so you know, there's been a lot of investment in this segment. Many of you guys have been part of that, right? Tickets just announced a new round yesterday. You guys are on round B, Kluke round D. But this year, you know, the two big OTAs in this space made some moves. Um, you know, Booking acquired Fair Harbor, and then TripAdvisor acquired Boken. So general thoughts on this, this shift, you know, good or bad for the industry? What, how is this going to impact what's going on? Well, if I may take the questions, um, from a B2C platform perspective, I think it's really happy that there's finally some sort of investment. Um, I think, unfortunately, we didn't see too much of the VC or private equity money that went into the B2B and SaaS system. Um, so now that the B2C player is putting some more resources on that, I think that will really accelerate the digitization of supply. And that's really key, because without that, we can't seamlessly sell that to a consumer. Um, I wish there was, for example, more of that in Asia, but in Asia, actually, there aren't really any SaaS companies um, out there. So for us, we had to build this kind of end-to-end -end solution one, on one side, connecting for merchants, but at the same time, obviously, then connect it to the consumer. So I see it as a positive sign, for sure. Okay. Overall, I think the attention uh, to the space, that's awesome. I think it brings credibility to what we're trying to do. That's great. Uh, obviously, as the supplier on the stage, I fundamentally think that reservation systems should be built to prop up and support the supplier. And so uh, we've got great relationships with all of our OTA partners. We would prefer to leverage OTA partners to help sell incremental inventory. And so when reservation systems are owned by OTAs, and those reservation systems that are owned by OTAs don't allow the supplier to really manage those channels. It's either on or it's off. That uh, can have some problematic implications down the road. And so I think suppliers should be very cautious in the way they move forward. Mm -hmm. I don't think that OTAs are necessarily evil and out there to get suppliers, but inventory is king. And so I think suppliers should be really cautious in the way that they move forward with that. Do you think there's concern that there may be bias, right, in terms of these alliances? Who are? Uh, bias in terms of these alliances, you know, prioritization of certain suppliers using technology. If I would be a supplier, I would definitely be concerned. I would be looking for an independent player to uh, manage my reservation si uh, system and at the same time making sure that I get as much traffic out of all the channels at the highest price possible. We've definitely seen that with Peak Pro. A lot of businesses that we work with, and we've had new people come in and say, you know, I really don't want to, to have a system that's owned by a large OTA. Um, and so we're definitely seeing, as the independent company in the space and the largest company providing SaaS software, we've definitely seen that businesses are flocking towards us in order to enable um, having an independent platform which has its best interests at heart. Ultimately, we're building software for the merchant um, with, with not... Uh, we're not looking at other uh, mechanisms to monetize today. Yeah. So the stronger recently, suppliers definitely want to go for an independent uh, solution, and the smaller ones, yeah, of course, for them it's free software, they pay a transaction fee, and if it drives a lot of traffic, then why not uh, connect to a Fair Harbor or, uh, or a Bokun? But if they, w when they grow, I think at one point they will get educated and uh, will go for an independent system again. Yeah. So TripAdvisor, they recently you know, enrolled a feature where if a supplier's product isn't online bookable on TripAdvisor, a very prominent window that you know, shows up that says, this product isn't bookable, how about these instead? So thoughts on implications of that, supplier reactions, you know, will there be backlash? Is this going to backfire? <laughs> uh, I don't know enough about that feature to, to fully comment I don't think that that notification that this isn't bookable online means this isn't loaded into Bokun, which is the reservation right. system of choice of TripAdvisor. I think it was more saying this supplier isn't connected to any API connection. And my response to that is shame on the supplier. Like you've 
got to give yourself options through direct, through indirect. Um, you know, my goal would be to work with every major OT out there, but to do it on our terms. And so, will there be backlash? Absolutely, there's always backlash. But should there be? I don't think so. I think the suppliers should better uh, educate themselves and better position themselves to where they're never put in that position to begin with. I think in terms of just getting everybody online, I think it's encouraging that. Um, with Pete Pro, we have integrations so that if somebody, somebody can get their bookings live on, on TripAdvisor, on Expedia, et cetera. So I think if somebody's able to use software, then frankly, these soft, you know, our software system connects, as do others, uh, into those systems. So um, this is only a situation that arises, I think, for businesses that are very small that haven't adopted software. So hopefully it will help everybody recognize that they have to do that. Um, the sad fact is that over 80% of tour operators <laughs> in of America yeah. and, and larger elsewhere um, are still not using any kind of online booking software. So I think there's a long ways to go in terms of getting everybody online. So if that helps encourage it, um, I think it's important. But I, I do think you will see operators not being happy to see that. Great. Now, as you know, some of these acquisitions have happened with the OTAs acquiring reservation technology companies, where do you think this leaves the rest of the res tech companies? Sorry, what was the question? I, I missed it. Where does this leave the rest of the res tech companies oh. as these, some of these other ones are getting you know, bought up by? I think, you know, I can chime in as, as, as a company that's providing <laughs> reservation software for tour operators. Um, I think it's a huge opportunity for us. I think what we're seeing is that there is this, you know, over 80% of operators that still aren't online. Um, you know, today we've got thousands of businesses. That needs to be tens of thousands of businesses, and it will be um, if we look at kind of the pattern that's been led by other industries, especially the hotel space. So I think it's, it's providing a huge opportunity. A lot of the things that were highlighted here about people wanting an independent system, um, suppliers wanting a system that's the best for them. You know, the average business that moves onto our platform sees a 30% increase in revenue and saves a ton of time and a better consumer experience. Um, so I think all of those things are things that merchants care about. So I think um, certainly for us as the business that's got the largest scale, I think there's a ton of opportunity and we're really excited about being able to double down and, and sell our software to more and more merchants and get more people online. So I think the independent structure is a big advantage for us today, um, as well as our ability to completely focus on making sure that the supplier has what they need. Mm -hmm. And if I may add to that, yeah. I think the market is so big, right? There's tours, there's activities, there's attractions. And I think for every different segment, uh, there is a, a place out there for a reservation system, mm -hmm. right? Because all of those need, have different needs. Yeah, absolutely. And as a B2C player, I would say that, you know, we also prefer that, you know, as a SaaS plus a distribution model that is also independent, you know? Um, and, and that's kind of more fair for other B2C players so that, you know, um, often they talk about is there a great wall when you know a B2C owns a B2B or a SaaS company? Is, is how 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 tall is that great wall? How thick is that great wall? So from from a B2C angle, out of a player, I, I would say that we also prefer the dependence of, of until you buy a system. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how the industry work out. Now you know in some of the other segments, there have been some you know big names that have really just taken the segment. You know Airbnb, Uber. Why in this space hasn't there been that big breakout name yet? What do you think is contributing to that? Well, I think from a consumer angle, um, and actually adding to Rizwana's point is, when you say Airbnb, when you say Uber, it's technically talking about one product, right? Airbnb, we're talking about a bed. You know, Uber, we're talking about a, a, just a seat in, in a car. So it is a much more faster scalable product, um, which of course also comes with, you know, does it burn more money because you can grow in, it um, in such a short time with, at such scale. While in the tourism activity space, we are really talking about multi-category. So it does take time to build, um, to go in depth into each vertical, but I would say that the value add is there and it's there to stay once you build deep enough into that vertical. And Plus, the global network effect as a B2C platform is a lot more relevant. So it's not like tomorrow another Kluko, another I don't know, TripAdvisor experience can come up and suddenly emerge from a particular region or, or local market. It really needs the global network effect. And now that they are emerged leading players, um, the dynamics definitely have shifted a bit. I agree with Eric. I think it's a function of scale. Today, we're doing hundreds of millions of dollars of bookings through our platform. As you get into billions of dollars, you're touching so many consumers that you will have opportunities for brand names to exist. Um, it's just the market is very, very large today, and any of the players today are driving a very small amount um, of that demand. And so I think as that increases, you will see those brands emerge. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Now, there's been a little bit more of supplier backlash towards the OTAs as some of them have gotten more aggressive in this space, right, related to commissions and just, you know, how involved they become with the business. So how can, you know, the two sides work together to avoid, you know, the friction that we see in the hotel segment, for instance, right? How can we kind of learn from that and not end up there? I think it goes to supplier, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I wish I could have a megaphone to not be talking to this audience, <laughs> but to the audience of suppliers, which is um, at some point you need to stop focusing on just operating your business and, and, and giving tours, but how are you running your business? And I think the long tail is so long in the supplier marketplace that uh, for them, distribution is distribution. Revenue is revenue, bookings are bookings. And that is great, but there is going to come a time when they can't grow anymore, and what are they doing to protect their margins? And if all of that revenue, all of those sales are tied to a commission, then you've really lost your business as a, as a whole. So I think what I would tell a young supplier is be very cautious in the way that you grow your business. And I'm not saying don't use an OTA, use an OTA, but at the same time, put an equal investment in your own direct sales channels so you don't put yourself in a situation where you're solely dependent on any one product or any one distribution channel. You know, from my perspective, I think the OTA model I think it's a lot more relevant for the tourism activity space because of a fragmentation of the supply. I think with airline, you, it's really just a handful number of airlines you know, globally. So that's why they drive a lot, a lot of direct bookings. And with the hotel chains, we've also seen consolid consolidation with Marriott and SP SPG. Hence, you have a powerful loyalty program. But if you look at the in-destination space, it's completely fragmented. Even the largest operators, like the theme parks, they don't even have a loyalty program, right? So Kluge, for us, for example, we've built a loyalty program around all the in-destination operators, so we become the trusted platform for consumers to come on board and to have that repeat purchase because of the trust that they have on the platform and also the loyalty program that kicks in as well. So I think that's where I think OTA actually, to me, is more relevant in the tools and activities space. Now, since it is such a fragmented space, right, there's this long tail, how do the intermediaries, how do you guys prioritize supply, right? You have the options of the big attractions all the way to the medium-sized tour operators like Jack's company or, you know, the one-person shop. So how do you prioritize what supply you bring onto your platforms? Um, well, we look at it by the user origin. So for certain markets where it's first-time travel, so let's say in Asia, Southeast Asia, it's a lot of first-time travel. So we will be targeting them, in providing kind of the main attractions, the biggest kind of things to do, must-do products. But then when you go to some more mature markets like Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, or even to some extent China, because China is such a big market, so you have a segment of it that actually is a bit more sophisticated, then we actually go a bit towards the mid-tail to the long-tail um, to, bring, to bring them on and to be able to market to them, because that's what we look for, in fact, the more unique experiences. So it's really understanding the origins and then matching it with the right supply rather than kind of a blanket approach and say, hey, I'm going to put spring on all type of products. Mm -hmm. Still, the vast majority of travelers are going after sort of the five highlights of a city, right, or a country when they visit it. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. that that's still what drives a lot of uh, revenue for the entire industry for sure. Yeah. And John, you guys, you know, are invested in tickets, which focuses on the big, you know, landmark attractions. Yep. Um, so very targeted um, supply. Is there concern that you know there's limited opportunity there? There's only they do drive volume, but there's only so many attractions in the world. At some point, will you max out? Absolutely true. But those venues sort of provide the temple, so then later on grow into let's say the yeah, medium-sized attractions. But still, there are 10,000 uh, scalable sort of venues in, in in Europe, Middle East, and uh, and the U.S. So there's still a large market ahead uh, for tickets. So still plenty of work ahead of you. Our approach has been more, you know, working with the fragmented businesses and going up, um, and that's, you know, allowed us in the, to enable thousands of businesses to come online. And I think what we've, with Peak, we're kind of we've taken a different approach. And I think that you guys have fo focused a lot more on the major attractions, really because you can fulfill that inventory. Mm -hmm. uh, I think our job has really been how do we get all of this inventory, because people do want to do um, a lot of these long tail things. Uh, they want to do a, an authentic experience and a food tour, or they want to be able to, to enable a lot of these more unique experiences. And so we've been doing that, and I think that's been very effective in allowing um, this inventory, hopefully, to 
to be bookable by everybody. You know, we've got deals with Yelp and Google and Groupon so that as a consumer, when you're going to those sites, you can also find the same activities and make them instantly bookable. So a lot of our work has been to take this long tail, which for a long time just wasn't being tackled, and bring it all online and also make it possible for a consumer, if they're doing a Google search, to instantly book and buy um, with Peak. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's been a big kind of change from just kind of selling the attractions into allowing everything to, uh, to be sold online. Alice, we have a question from the audience. Sure. My question is simple. It's actually for Eric. I want to know the attitude of a tourist activity OTA towards owning a third-party reservation system versus using one. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't get the question. Uh, Could you repeat it one more time? Uh, what's your attitude towards oh. owning a third-party reservation system like Peak right. versus just using it? just partnering with them or using several? So, you got question. Yeah, well, I think that really depends on the supply side, right? So if the supply is only using Peak or using Fair Harbor or, or XYZ, then we'll, we'll have to go with what the supply, we're not going to say force the supply and say, oh, you have to work with um, ABC because the ABC has been aligned with us today. So we are actually open and we're open working with multi SaaS companies. But it just, I think from, from a B2C perspective, um, we do prefer that, we, that the SaaS company or the distribution company is independent. But if it's not, then it's not like a, a major deal for us, a ma major problem for us. And, you know, TripAdvisor and Booking, it's not like they're only exclusively working with the suppliers that own uh, or that are uh, using this uh, technology that they've bought. So um, that hasn't... There aren't enough suppliers online for them to make that decision yeah. right now. Yeah. I don't know how long it'll take for them to get to that point, <laughs> but once it's there, that may be a different decision for them to make at that time. Yeah. Now, this is, the answer to this is going to vary based on what uh, you guys do specifically, but Booking and Google, right, they have both moved into this space. So which one worries you more or which one excites you more, right, depending on what your business model is here? Who wants to go first? Um, I can take it. I think, um, I think between worry and excite, I think if that's too extreme, I would say obviously Booking will fall into the more worry part because we would be a peer towards kind of a B2C play. In fact, we look at Google as a channel, right? Mm -hmm. Google is a channel, SEO, SEM has been, right? And in, but in fact, Facebook has also emerged as one of the channel, right? Maybe in the next five years, it's Alexa, um, Amazon that will become a channel. So to us, it's just about which channel is the is the most meaningful one that can drive conversions. Um, and, and hence, on, on the worrisome, then it's more of a booking where they definitely have the capital, they have the user base, um, and the influence on, on the suppliers as well, and obviously now with the SaaS system. So I would say that would be more of a yeah, worrisome part. I, I completely agree. I think the, the guys at Tickets are partnering with Google to actually get their inventory live on Google Reserve as one mm -hmm. of the uh, first in the attractions uh, space. Actually, I think the only one uh, in the attraction space by now in, uh, in Europe. And just stay ahead of the curve. But you never know what Google's going to do, what Google's going to do in the end. Yeah. And Peak's plugged in as well, right? To yeah, we yeah. did the same thing with, yeah. uh, with uh, Google as well. Um, and I think, if anything, it's less of a worried and excited. It's an inevitability. Mm -hmm. It was always going to happen. It's a huge segment. It would be silly of them not to want to do more in it. Yeah. And so with what Tickets and Peak is doing is I can go in Google search and look up MoMA in New York, right? And that search result where it comes up on the side with the map and the hours of operation. Now yeah. there's a button it's there. Power, powered by Tickets, and then you can buy Exactly. Or powered by Peak Pro to allow yeah. you to instantly book. Okay. Now, Booking, they've taken a little bit of a different approach, right? So their platform is in a closed environment, so it's not like I can just go on Booking.com and there's an activities tab and I can go browse and shop. So not like a Kluk or a, a, not a discovery platform, right? Um, it's really people who have already booked the hotel and they're sent a link and they are given the QR code. They can walk by the museum and they'll get an alert like, hey, just go and scan this barcode and it's going to process their payment. They'll skip the line. And so they've taken out a lot of friction related to being in destination, um, the payment process, ticketing. So what are your thoughts on the advantages versus disadvantages of this model compared to some of the more traditional OTA open platform discovery? I think the larger venues are not necessarily waiting for booking to tell them what kind of system they should use, right? And of course, they, are, they love more traffic, these higher value traffic uh, that they can yield better. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's 
imposing that kind of technology on venues where you have big queues outside is just not going to work in the end. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our panelists.